Now, once you become a believer and you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's gifts that come with the Holy Spirit. And we have churches that don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They believe that they exist and they don't, and we don't have them anymore. And, they, and different churches, different denominations have different reasons why they say, oh, that was, that's not for today. Well, we're going to read the scriptures and see if they're still for today, okay? Some religions teach that the miracles and the gifts have ceased when the apostles died. Some churches say that. When the apostles died, that's when the gifts were over. If this is true, then the people who are living by these gifts right now, they're either lying or they're being very deceitful. Deceitful by the devil. It's one of those two. If the gifts aren't for today. The These people are out there who are doing miracles, speaking in tongues, prophesying. If that's not for today, the then they must be lying or the devil, like I said, the devil has them deceived. That's the only way you can look at it. We're going to find out though. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 through 10 and then 12. It says, Charity, which is love, never faileth. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now love, charity, that's God's love. And the only way you can have God's love is by being a born again Christian. Lost people can't have God's love. We have God's love. I did a teaching on the Beatitudes. and Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are meek. You know, all that is love. And only Christians can have that kind of love. We have it now and we still have it even when, get, even when we get to heaven. We're still going to have it because it, right here it says, Love never faileth. All these, uh, these other gifts that I just mentioned... He said those will, those will go away. But love will never go away. And it won't. Because when we go to be with the Lord, we should still have that same love. We should have it now. But if you don't, you're going to get it when you get there. Okay? Because then we're going to be perfect, remember. But love, that's never going to fail. But these other gifts, they say that, it's, that God says it's going to fail. Prophecies. Prophecies come from a man or a woman. Because a woman is called a prophetess. And the Bible talks about women being being able to do that. It's speaking for the Lord. That's you're speaking for the Lord. That's when the Lord is wanting to reveal something to the church. Someone will get up and prophesy. So that's what prophecy is. Speaking for the Lord when the Lord wants someone when when the Lord wants the church to know to reveal something to the church. In Acts fifteen, verse thirty two. And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. They were encouraging and strengthening their faith with prophecy. That's what the Lord, he, a, lot, a lot of times His prophecy is to help us, to strengthen us. That's what prophecy is for, to encourage and to strengthen us. He speaks a word to the church. Now, there's three different kinds of tongues in the Bible. And I think we spoke about this before. There's the tongues on the day of Pentecost where tongues was just a different language. And there's another tongue, the unknown tongue, where it's between just you and the Lord. When you're praying, you're praying in an unknown tongue. You're praying in God's language, just you and Him. And then there's tongues in the church where the Lord says, one person gets up, speaks in tongues, and then He sits down and another person gets up and God gives him the interpretation of it. Now those are the three kind of tongues they have. The gift of knowledge. It says about the gift of knowledge. It gives insight on the understanding of the truth of God's word. That's the gift of knowledge. The Lord gives us certain, he gives certain saints this special ability to, to understand his words. To discover the full meaning of the text or context of what he's reading. And I, I take it that's what I have. Because the Lord reveals to me what the scriptures mean. And that's when I, and I give them to y'all. So the gift of knowledge is you get, you get an understanding of God's words. You get an understanding of it. And teachers and preachers especially depend on this knowledge from God. 
the gift of knowledge to understand His Word so we can interpret it right. 1 Corinthians 12.8 says, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. So the gift of knowledge can't go away because we need teachers. Like I said, now remember, you got religions out there that say, these, we don't have these anymore. But right here, we still have teachers, right? Mm -hmm. So a teacher needs this gift. Alright, so I'm going to show you through the scriptures that the gifts are still for today. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are the Doria gifts. Which means these gifts are to run the church. You need, you need a pastor. You need teachers. This helps runs the church. The church. These, would be, these are the Rhea gifts. Now, there's different kind of... There's the Rhea gifts and there's charismatic gifts, charismatic gifts. And we'll get to that. The Lord doesn't give us gifts and then take them away. He doesn't do that. Like some people preach. Oh, that's, we don't have them no more. Well... In Revelations, chapter 11, verse 3, it says, And I will give power unto the two witnesses. Now, who is two witnesses? It's talking about tribulation. During the tribulation, God's going to have two witnesses. What I'm trying to show, that these two witnesses, it says, And they shall prophesy a thousand and two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. Now, if they have the gift of prophecy during the tribulation, then why did the Lord take it away now? Like He gave it in the old times. He took it away now, but then He's going to bring it back in the tribulation? That's not the way God works. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. That's what the Bible says. So, if, it was, if they're going to have it in the tribulation, then we have it now. I'm just showing this. And then verse 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. And this is the Word of God. And He says, we don't have a full understanding right now. Right now, we don't have a complete understanding of His words. You know, we study them. I mean, I could study this Bible until I'm 100 years old, and I still ain't going to get to have a full understanding of the Bible. Okay? So He says, For we know in part, right now, then in verse 10, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Who is the perfect one? Jesus. It tells us in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And who is our Father? Jesus. Okay, Jesus and the Father are one, right? So Jesus is perfect. So it's a, But when that which is perfect has come, it's got to be speaking about Jesus. Then that which is important, because we know just in part right now, when Jesus comes, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it's, it's going to be talking about the second uh, God's second return. After the tribulation, when God comes back again. That's what it's talking about. When Jesus returns from the second coming, we, we won't, after the second coming, we won't need prophets. We won't need these gifts anymore because we're going to be with Him. We're going to be with God. So we won't need them. Then That's when they're going to cease. So these gifts will cease. Except love, like it says. We won't need the Bible. Because we'll be with the Bible. God is the Bible. So we'll be with the Bible. We'll see the Bible. We don't read it. We'll see it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> when I laugh sometimes, because it's not... I, I think it's, man, that is great. You know, that we're, Jesus, Jesus is going to be our Bible. Just like the disciples walked with Him here on earth, we're going to walk with Him. But we're not, we're not going to have to fear the Jews or anybody coming to kill us. Amen? Amen. Now drop down to verse 12. It says, For now we see through a glass darkly. Which pretty much means the same. For we know in part. Saying the same thing. But then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So now we see through a glass darkly. Same thing. We as Christians are forever growing and we don't have a full understanding of God's ways. So we see through God's darkly. But then, he says, but then face to face, 
But remember it says prophecy, tongues, knowledge will cease. Well that's going to cease. That's going to cease when we see Jesus face to face. Like I said, when, once we, when next time we see Jesus, we're going to be with Him in heaven. He's not going to appear right now. All these things you see on TV, you know, they have the image of Jesus on the screen or a rock or something. Jesus is not going to appear to anybody right now. The next time we see Jesus, He's coming in the cloud and He's going to take His saints, which is us. You know, you have a religion that has saint this and saint that. Saints is us. Anybody who is a born again Christian is a saint. Okay? Amen? Amen. So the word then. Then, face to face. Now let's stay in the same chapter here. In verse 10, it said, When that which is perfect is come, which we have read, you know, that is Jesus. Then in verse 12, it says, We can see him face to face. We can't see him right now, like I said, because Exodus 33, verse 20. It says, And he said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. That's when Moses appeared to, to God in the flaming bush, and God and Moses wanted to see him, God said, I'm going to let you see my backside. That's what he told Moses, because you can't see my face. And this is why. No man can see God's face and live. That's what it says. Verse 12 says, in English, right now, we don't understand the complete picture, but when Jesus comes and we see Him in person, then we will be enlightened and our eyes will completely understand. So, when it says, then face to face, that then is when Jesus comes. The second coming is when the, the, when the gifts are going to cease. That the second coming. Now, we're going to see Jesus at the rapture. That's when... Our gifts are going to, the gifts that we use are going to cease because we won't need them no more. But the gifts are still going to be here on earth because the, the saints that are, going to go, that are going to go through the tribulations and the Jews. Because after the rapture, the Jews will finally realize that Jesus was the Son of God. You know, Jews don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But after the rapture, that's when they'll, and that's what it talks about in the tribulation, the, the Jews will recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. But anyway, it's going to be that time here on earth they're still going to have the gifts. But when we're raptured, we no longer need them because we're going to be with, with the Lord. Amen? It also says it in the Old Testament. But it's in Acts 2, verses 16 through 18. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Now note that he said upon. You got to be filled with the spirit to be able to do this. You got to be filled with the spirit. The spirit is going to come upon you. And in verse 18, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now this was this is in the book of Acts talking about what the prophet Joel said. And you can find that in Joel. I'll read it where it, where it says that in, in Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 29 it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now Joel is speaking about the second coming here. If you read the book of Joel in the Old Testament. It's talking about the second coming. Remember, always remember this. If you read the Old Testament, and I showed you this before, Jesus said in the New Testament, the whole Old Testament is about Him. Whatever you read in the Old Testament, it's about Jesus. Now, of course, you have those who refuse to believe this, so they say all this was just for the spiritual elite, like I said, the, the apostles. In verse 29 of Joel and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens. In those days will I pour out my spirit. So it sounds like to me that anyone will be able to prophesy. I mean, he's pretty much covered everybody here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, remember it says, Charity never, surety never faileth. For whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And that's how it's going to happen. Love is not going to go. 
gifts are here until the second coming. Let's look at what Paul had to say in Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7. 1 Corinthians 1 7. So that ye, this is Paul speaking in the New Testament. So that ye come behind in no gifts waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that plain or what? Paul in the New Testament says he doesn't want us to come behind in no gifts. In no gifts waiting for the for the coming of the Lord. So what he's saying is, until the Lord comes, He doesn't want us to 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 uh, have, not have these gifts. I mean, are, am I the only one who sees that, or does it show? Right? Just just this one verse tells you that we become that we don't go behind in no gifts, that we'd not be without gifts until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is what he's saying. These are the two words for the word gifts in the Bible. Like I said before, one means, in Greek, it means charismata. And that's meaning a divine and spiritual endowment, like speaking in tongues, or a word of wisdom, or not a word of knowledge. That's that kind of gifts. And then the other one is called doria gifts, which means people who have gifts, like I said earlier, pastor, teacher, those are gifts for the church. So there's two different kind of gifts, Doria and Charismata. Charismata, like I said, is, is for everybody. The Doria gifts are for people, to be, for men to be pastors, for men to be teachers. Not everybody can be a pastor. Not everybody can be a teacher. These are Doria gifts. But the Charismata, Charismata gifts, everyone can have those gifts. You understand? Make sure, let's make sure that we see that Jesus is saying these words in Mark. Chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, and verse 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Remember, the word go in Greek means going, as you're going. That's what he's saying, to preach the word of the, of the Lord. Then in John 20, 21, it says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. As the Father sent Jesus to come tell us about God, about His Father, He's telling us now we need to go tell people about the Father. Just like He sent Jesus, He's saying now you go just like the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So you see we all have a ministry. When you become a born again Christian, God is sending you. He's saying I'm sending you. He's not asking you to go. He's saying I'm send- this is a command. I'm sending you out there just like the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. But, did Jesus go door to door? Like some religions? No, He didn't go door to door. Did He pinch a tent and have people come to Him? No, He didn't pinch no tent. He went to the people. And as He was going to the people, people came to Him. But He didn't put no tent and and just stayed right there. Jesus moved around as He was going. Like I said, the word go is as He was going. He was preaching about the Lord. Did He build a fancy building? That costs a lot of money. I don't see how the Lord don't strike some of these. I would say churches, but men, because men are the one who build. They spend all this money on churches. Let me say this: if we would use the money that the churches get on tithings, if we would use that money to feed the poor, the government would not even have to spend them. They wouldn't. We wouldn't have to have no government help because churches. Are rich. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we just found that out. With yeah, with the Osteen. <laughs> but I mean, that's just that church. But all churches bring in a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people who die. Mm-hmm. There's some people who don't. But to, but as a whole, churches have a lot of money, and they build those churches. They build these buildings that cost, you know, what, a couple of million, maybe even more, to build. We could be. How many people do you think we can reach for the Lord if we was to go out there and feed them in the name of Jesus? That's why I'm saying, you know, the lost people ain't gonna like me, but even Christians won't like me because uh, I'm sure you have pastors. If they hear this, they're not gonna like this. But it's the truth. We don't need buildings. Churches was in the home. Remember, it started in the home, and it wasn't until the Romans got the the Catholic Romans. 
when I forgot the guy's name. I have such a bad memory. But anyway, he's the one who said, we're going to put it in the church so he can have control over the people. That's why he put it in a building. That's when churches started in the building because this king wanted to have control over the religion. That's when the church went downhill. Because back when it was in the homes, remember that I taught you? People were getting saved daily. Daily. Are we getting people saved daily in our church? No, we're not. Why? Because people pass by our church and they don't care what's going on inside that building. As long as we're not bothering them, they pass our building all the time. Don't worry about a thing. But if the church was out on the streets like this, you could reach people. And it doesn't mean that God's going to send you to Africa. You got some people who are scared to to become Christians or move in the Spirit because they're afraid God's going to send them to Africa. We have a lot of people out there who are in missions on their own. God did not send them. God did not send them. I say that because I see it. I mean, I see young kids, and I call them kids. I mean, they could be in their 20s, but they're still kids. They're baby. They're just baby Christians. Even if they were, grew up as Christians, they're still baby Christians. And they're going out there on missions. God says a preacher or a teacher, and that's what they're going out there to do, is not young. Should not be a young person. Also, if God wanted them to go, if God wanted them to go, they wouldn't have to be begging for money. A lot of these missionaries, they can't go unless they get money. And so uh, they have, they do this or they do that just to collect the money. If God wants you to go, just like He sent His disciples out, He told His disciples, don't take nothing with you. I'm going to supply everything you need. That's because Jesus sent them. But when you go on your own, because that's what you want to do, and we have a lot of missionaries that way, then you got to struggle. Jesus did the same way He's telling us to do. He went out to the people and preached the gospel. That's what He did. When I'm out there in the world, I, I mean, be anybody who knows me, I mean, really knows me, when I go out there, I'm going to witness. I'm going to tell people about the Lord. I mean, that's just me. No, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit in me. That's because I'm allowing the power of God to come out of me. It's not Jesse. Remember, I'm, Jesse is nothing. But when I let the Holy Spirit come out of me, now that's the Holy Spirit you're seeing. Not Jesse. Because Jesse grew up a, night, a very quiet person. Very quiet. My third grade teacher sent a note home to my mother saying, Get this boy around kids. He never says anything. My daddy used to get mad at me all the time because every time we went somewhere, I'd never say nothing. And he'd get mad and come home and gripe at my mother. <laughs> but uh, I was a very quiet person. I started drinking. Why? Because it brought me out. It brought, it, I would come out of my shell. But now I don't need alcohol to bring me out of my shell. I don't need alcohol. Now I got the Holy Spirit to bring me out of my shell. Whoever would have thought this quiet little kid would stand in front of the church and preach somewhere. Or do this, stand in front of y'all and teach. I'm telling you, I was very quiet. And I never got in trouble either. My sister's right here, she could tell you. As a little boy, I never got in trouble. Because I never did anything. <laughs> in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it says, To compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Jesus, the Lord, wants His house to be filled. It's not going to be. But that's Jesus' will, that His house be filled. And Jesus says it's His will that everybody gets saved. That's His will. But He doesn't make us turn to Him. He's given us our own free will. He's given us our own free will. We decide if we want to be with Him or not. It's His will that we do, but He's given us our own will to decide if we want to. But believe me, the Lord wants everybody to be saved. And like I said, they're not drawn by big fancy churches. I've said that before. You know, these big fancy churches like they got in Houston and, and they got bowling alleys. and I mean, they, they put all this stuff in the churches. Pool tables and all this to reach people. Well, yeah, they reach people to play games. But that's not going to reach them for the Lord. 
Because I've, I've, show, I've showed y'all over and over. What reaches them for the Lord? The Holy Spirit. John 6.44 It says, No man can come to me. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And he sent in who? Us. So that's to me. No man can come to the Father except the Father which hath sent me draw him. So we have to have the Holy Spirit. These big churches, I don't care how fancy they look, or they're going to collect a crowd. They're going to get a lot of people. But they're there just for show. They're there for, for show. They want to be able to say, oh, I go to this church because it's so big and beautiful. That's, what, that's why they go there. Remember, people, the Lord said, wide is the gate to hell. Narrow is the gate to heaven. You get these churches that have thousands of members. When Jesus walked the earth, did he have thousands of members? Very few followed him. When he did have, a, when he fed the, the thousands, why do you think they were there? Because he was feeding them. But when it came time to stand behind them, when the Jews got him and wanted to kill him, where was all these people at? These thousands of people that were following, where were they? They weren't there, were they? They were following him because he was feeding them. And this is the same thing with the church. I'm telling you, I belong to First Baptist whatever, or First, you know, whatever, because it's a big church and they want to say, that's where I go. There's a lot of religious people in the world, a lot of religious people, and religious people like to be known as going to a big fancy church. A lot of stuff that I say, I'm sure it offends religious people, it, I know it does, but we want to hear the Word of God. In fact, these church buildings are not from the Lord. Remember, the church is what? A group of believers. This, this right now can be considered a church. Because we're a group of believers right here. This is, this is a church right here. Amen? Amen? So, going to a building? Oh, I'm at church. Well, is it nothing but a group of believers there? Or do they have lost people there? When, once they get lost people there, it's no longer a church. It's a fellowship, it's a gathering, whatever you want to call it. Most churches like this next verse. Most of them. Verse 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, the first part of this verse, they like. But you're not going to have too many preachers who preach about hell. They're not going to have too, um, the second part, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You think preachers are going to go up there and preach that? You find very few preachers who are going to preach that right there. Because one, it offends people. And two, for a, lot of, for a lot of preachers, they don't want to say that because guess what? It's going to affect the tithing. It's going to affect the money he's bringing in. Most churches do not accept this one. In verse 17, And, the, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and thou shalt speak with new tongues. Now it says, what does it say here? It says, these signs will follow those who believe. This is why this is not happening in a lot of churches. Because they don't believe. I mean, they believe in the Lord. But they don't believe in this right here. This verse right here. And these signs shall follow them that believe. That's us. In my name shall they cast out devils. And they shall speak with new tongues. Now this new tongues. I, when I got born again. I speak with a new tongue now. Because before, you had a lot of foul language coming out of my mouth. And before, you used to have dirty jokes coming out of my mouth. But now I have a new tongue. This doesn't mean speaking in tongues. This is a new tongue. And when you become a born-again Christian, you have a new way of speaking. You don't talk the way you used to. I was in the army. I mean, I had a foul word for every sentence I had. So I had this new tongue. But a lot of churches don't like this verse. They don't like it. And say, I cast out devils. Christians can cast out devils. I mean, it's not, it's not as much as it used to be in the time of Jesus. They had to do it all the time. But nowadays, it, it's still here. But not like it was back then. But it, the, the movie The Exorcist, you don't need no holy water. Because there is no holy water. There's no such a thing as holy water. Water is just water. But in the movie, they had to go through all these rituals. No. You read the Bible, 
The Bible says just call the name of Jesus and rebuke the devil out of that person. That's all you have to do. That's it. Religion makes it, well, you got to do this and you got to get that. And we, we right here in this room, if, if the Lord was to use us, if we was, if, if James, if you was one of a person who was possessed with the devil, Jesus could say, G, uh, James, I want you to cast the devil out of the person in my name. And so what you do is you go up there and you say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the devil to get out of that person. And he's got to come out because you're doing it in the name of Jesus. Remember the name of Jesus is the most powerful name above all names. Remember that. And when you're doing it in the spirit, the devil has, the demon has no choice but to flee. He can't fight it. He has to flee. Because the demon cannot stand against the word of God. Amen? Amen. Like I said, that movie, The Exodus, that, that was a joke. I mean, I saw it and at the time I didn't know it was a joke. Because I wasn't born again. But he didn't scare me. And a lot of people scared the heck out of him. But I mean, I was right there right in front because it was so packed. I had to sit right up in front. But it didn't scare me. But it was, now, that I, now that I know and I read the Word of God, now I can see how, how funny that, sh- that how, how ridiculous that movie was. But you do have religions that believe exactly that way. John 9, I mean Mark 9, verse 38 And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us. And we forbade him, because he followed not us. Now, this, the men who were saying this, because these people, excuse me, because these people weren't doing it with them, they were from another, they believed in God, but they were just from another uh, I don't want to say religion. Another sect of Christians, and that's today. You know, we're, we're, okay, we go to a Baptist church. Are we the only ones who can do things? No, you got other churches that can do things also. So just because they they're not of our church, the men right here were like, well, because they're not of us. What are they doing doing that? And Jesus said, hey, they're believers. So believers, we're supposed to be like this, one happy family. But we're all divided. You know, there's only one Bible, but how many different religions they got? It doesn't matter what, well, the denomination you're from. If you're a born again Christian, if the Lord says, cast the devil out of that person, you can do it. If it, Whatever gift He gives you, whatever gift, you can do it. Alright? If He wants to give you the gift of tongues to, to reach a Chinese or someone that you don't know their language, but He wants you to use you, He'll use you. Amen? Mm -hmm. Our Lord is not limited. And a lot of churches limit our Lord. Verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now the book of Acts is is the beginning of the church, which is our time period. Okay, you had the Old Testament... Animal sacrifices. But when Jesus gave his blood, that was the final sacrifice, right? That was the final blood sacrifice. So that's when the New Testament started. A new covenant. The old covenant was animals. The new covenant was Jesus' blood. Everything's still the same. Everything else is still the same. It's just we no longer sacrifice animals. Jesus was the final sacrifice. So that's what began the new church. And we're living in the new church today. But anyway, what I'm trying to show all the, these gifts are for today. I've given you many scriptures to show that they're for the day, today. And they're missing out on God's blessings. They're missing out on a lot of blessings. Now the next statement, most churches accept. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Do we, have, we do have a lot of churches that accept that. In John 14, verses 13 and 14... It says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, of course, we have religions that take that to... You want a Cadillac? Ask for it. 
Because it says right here, ask in my name. Ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you. Let me make these faces because that's I don't want to say nothing. I just want to make faces because it's so ridiculous. Whatever, whatsoever you ask in my name. When he is saying, ask in his name, he's saying, ask in my will. We got, we're asking, you know, what, what is God's will for us to have or to do? In James 4, verse 3, you ask and receive not. Now, how come we don't receive? Because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. Meaning, hey, we're asking for things just for us, for pleasure. That's what he's saying right here. James is warning us that we shouldn't ask with wrong motives. You know, just to please ourselves, just for to pleasure ourselves. You know, like I said, I mean, you see him on TV. Uh, you want a three-story house? What do they say? Just ask for it. Or believe it. Believe that you got it. And it will be yours. And people believe that. A lot of people believe that. It plainly tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 17. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. You know, I think in their Bible, they might have scratched that out. Really, seriously. It plainly says it. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Is that simple? Mm-hmm. Was that simple to understand, to read? Yes, the Lord says, ask and you shall receive. But what does He say? you got to read the whole Bible. Like I said, you got to read the whole Bible and put it together. So this verse says, okay, yeah, you can ask. But make sure you're asking in His will. And he says up in that other verse, he said, so the sun will be glorified. If you get a three-story house, is that glorifying the sun? How's that going to glorify the sun? You get a a Mercedes Benz. How's that going to glorify the sun? And that's what they teach. If you don't have it, it's because you you haven't asked for it. I guess I need to send them a letter and put this verse on there in capital letters and send it to them. When we obey God's commands... He will honor the obedience that we give Him. And when we have a request and we ask according to His will, He will provide. Amen? Amen. The believers who want what God wants, we will be blessed. Amen. Now let's go back to Mark 16 real quick. Remember, He's speaking to believers. In verse 20 of Mark 16... It says, And they went forth and preached everywhere. And they went. Which means, as you're going. As you're going. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. The Lord working with them. And confirmed the word with signs following. So when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're walking with the Lord, you're going to have signs that follow. And they're not believing in the signs. They're believing in the word that you're telling them. Signs will happen. But that comes after you believe. Some people look for signs to get saved. No. You're not going to be saved by signs. Signs come after you believe. Not before you believe. Now you have preachers who say these gifts were just for the apostles. Like I said. But in Matthew's Matthews 18. Verse 16 through 20 and Mark 16, 15 through 18, which they call this the Great Commission, as you know, for us to go out. Well, if this was just for the apostles, then this is it, then, then these verses are not for us. If they say these gifts and stuff were just for the apostles and these signs would follow, if that was just for the apostles, then we don't have the ministry of going out and telling people about Jesus. Because these were the apostles here that did in in these verses that I just gave you. This commission is not just for the apostles, it's for all of us. I can show you in many places. I just did a while ago where the Lord, as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. And there's many places in the Bible like that. Now the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read you a letter that Billy Graham, 
Now, is Billy Graham a Pentecostal preacher? No, Billy Graham is just a man of God who preaches salvation to lost people. He's an evangelist. All he preaches is salvation. Okay, he preaches to the lost people. It's, uh, let me read this. They had a wife who sent a letter to Billy Graham saying, I have two daughters who are caught up in the charismata movement. And one wants to remove herself from the church membership. My husband and I are very heartbroken over this. What do we do? He answers and says, now this is Billy Graham. What you are referring to is the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of Christian people. It's a far deeper work than Christians are used, are, are used in recent times. Therefore, in many churches, it means exploring New territory. Never an easy step to take. On that Billy Graham man. And this is so true what he's saying. And he said more. For him to rise. From the scriptures that there are more. to There's more to Christianity than just going to church. Pastors ought to learn from his answer to these people. He said there's more to Christianity. Than just going to church. He says for a lot of people it's a new territory. And tonight, from what I've been teaching, this is probably a new territory for y'all. That we have a gift from the Holy Spirit. We have power from the Holy Spirit. We have the charismata gifts. And Billy, Billy Graham, which is kind of like a pastor, I mean a, a Baptist kind of like. I mean, he was he's not Pentecostal. He's not speaking in tongues and all that. He's just like a, he's just a man of God preaching the word. But right here he's telling these people, these parents... This is a new territory for a lot of Christians. It is. Now some Christians have been knowing it, but for a lot of people it's new. And this is what Billy Graham is saying. He did suggest that if they are able to experience the same kind of walk there in their church, they shouldn't leave. If their church was to be moving in the Spirit, then they shouldn't leave. He did suggest also that the parents and the daughters search the Scriptures and see what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. For him to realize from the scriptures, just like we did on this teaching, we realize, we learn, there's more to the Holy Spirit than just Him coming in you. Isn't that what we learned? Mm -hmm. There's more to it than the Holy Spirit coming in us when we get born again. It is for real, it is alive, and we're not using it. I'm going to say that because I, I've said it over and over. I'm out there. At church. I'm out there. I see Christians living defeated lives. And that's terrible. There is no sense for that. We have the power of God in us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And who's in the world? The devil. So greater is God that is in you than he that is in the world, which is the devil. So God is telling me, you are greater, you are stronger, you are mightier than the devil with me in you. Just let me out. And I'll take full control. We need to quit living defeated lives. We need to. Because if... I mean, it's up to you. If you want to live a defeated life, it's up to you. But know this, and you've learned it through this lesson. You have the power of God. Creator of heaven and earth. The awesome God that we sing about inside of us there is no reason no reason that we should be living defeated lives we need to believe his words we need to believe his words greater is he that is in you do you believe that James do you believe that God is greater than the devil oh, yeah. well that greater is in you can you comprehend that Jody can you comprehend comprehend that you have all this power you have the power of God inside of you most of us don't. Because if we did, we'd jump up right now and say, Amen. Hallelujah. I got the power in God of, of God in me. You know, I didn't know that. But now you showed me that. Whoa. Really, seriously. Come on. Power of God is in you. Amen. Amen. And you're just sitting there. <laughs> I'm serious. Come on. This is the Word of God. If I was in the church... I'd be amen and for sure. Out loud. I mean, and this is what we're going to learn next week. God has promises in there. 
And it, if it doesn't make you excited, if you don't leave this house next week full of joy and happiness from the scriptures I'm going to give us next week, something's wrong. One, you either lost and you don't, you don't have the slightest idea what I'm talking about. Or two, you was, you're not listening. God said, him who has ears, let him hear. Are y'all hearing what this this teaching, this lesson was on? So when we walk out this door tonight, how are we going to walk out of here? The same? Shouldn't we walk out of here a new person? Because that's what God does. He changes our lives. He changes our lives to be better. And what can be better knowing that God is in control of our life and has given us everything we need to fight whatever comes our way. And this fighting... God does the fighting. God says over and over, all we do is stand. I did a teaching on that. The way we fight, we stand. God does the battle. He does the fighting. All we got to do is stand. God says we put all this armor on in Ephesians, the helmet of salvation. We put all this armor on and then at the end He says, and then stand. Did He say go fight? Now you got all this armor on, go fight? No. Amen? Amen. Do we have a good... A good uh, God is so great. Our, uh, there's no words for me to define our God. Awesome is not enough. Great, beautiful. Those words are not even enough to describe who God is. And we've learned through this lesson, we have that God inside of us. Do not, do not, do not, do not go out there and when you're by yourself, you are by yourself, and there's no Christians around you, don't feel like you got to crumble up. Like, I don't have no brothers or sisters around me. You, know. you got God with you. Amen. There's a whole lot better than us being with you. Amen? Amen. I, hope y'all, I hope y'all heard and received. Because you can hear and not receive. So I, I, I pray to God that y'all received this lesson. Now if you still go out there tomorrow and you're still a little wimp, apparently you didn't receive. This is the words of God. I gave you all the scriptures. Read them. Let them sink into your heart and believe. And believe. That's the big thing. Believe what He says. Amen? Amen.